All right. So welcome everybody to the latest of our IAPS at a distance sessions. Uh, these are hosted by the International Association of Physics Students. And today we're going to be tackling the hefty topic of climate change. Uh, for this, I'm very grateful to be joined by two members of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, we have with us today, Mr. Jonathan Lin, the Head of Communications and Media Relations, and as well, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fatima Drivesh, the Vice Chair of the IPCC's Working Group One. Um, so the way that this session is going to proceed today, uh, we're going to have both of our speakers give a talk on their areas of expertise in the IPCC in turn. Um, feel free to submit questions, either if you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook in the comments or using the Q&A button in Zoom session. And after the talks, we will, I will ask a few questions of the speakers and then we will open up to questions from the audience. So I believe it was, it's Jonathan who's starting first with the talk, yes? Yeah, hi, hi everybody. And th thanks very much for this, this invitation. Um, you know, we are, we are, we're really pleased to be talking to this audience today because, you know, obviously we have a special responsibility to inform young people um, about climate change because uh, you, you are the ones who are gonna be feeling the long-term uh, consequences of it. And um, of course, the, the scientific community is a key audience of the IPCC. And when we get the two together, young scientists, that's really great because we hope that some of you are gonna be future collaborators of the IPCC too. So um, my job in the IPCC is uh, head of communications. I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about what the IPCC is institutionally, how it works, how it does its reports. And then Fatima is gonna give you um, I uh, explain some of the scientific findings to you. I'm by background, I'm a journalist and not a scientist. So I'm not even allowed to talk about science in the world of the IPCC, but we're very lucky to have uh, Fatima with us today, who's one of our experts and, and Bureau, Bureau members. Um, so let me uh, share my screen for the PowerPoint. Yes, we're very excited to be collaborating with the IPCC on this today. Um, and I'm happy to have uh, Jonathan here as our first speaker. Um, he's indeed a journalist and has been a foreign correspondent and editor for the Reuters news agency for 32 years before joining the IPCC, um, reporting for, from an impressive 30 countries around the world. Um, his academic background is a Master in Arts from Cambridge University, studying modern languages. And he's also a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. So I think you may be more qualified to speak on science than you than you say. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so, um, let's see if that... Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, why the IPCC? We're, we're now 32 years old and we were founded in 1988 because in the 1970s, 1980s, there was a growing awareness of the, of the phenomenon of climate change and people wondering what, what's going on, what's, what's causing it, what can we do about it. Um, this gradually became something that the political community, policymakers, governments were concerned about. And there was an exponential rise in the amount of scientific literature coming out about this. And it was more than uh, any individual and indeed many governments could keep on top of all at once, especially where some of the scientific research seemed to uh, disagree with each other. So two bodies of the United Nations, the, the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program decided to set up a body which would bring together the scientific community to assess um, all the research on um, climate change, all the science related to climate change, both the, the, the fact of climate change, but also how, how it's impacting us uh, how we can adapt to it and also what we can do about it to, to prevent it in the future. And um, uh, so our, our job basically is to tell 
policymakers. Policymakers are our prime audience, not, not the general public, but policymakers very explicitly, though we do reach out to, to the public and, as I said, the scientific community and other groups like business and so on, so we keep them informed. Our job is to say, this is what we know about climate change. This is what we don't know, where we need to do more research. This is where there are differences. Um, but we give a picture of the, the state of knowledge to policymakers so they can take informed evidence-based decisions. And um, in, in, the, in these 30 plus years, again, again, there's been an exponential growth in the um, number of papers and research, amount of research. And we've produced five comprehensive um, uh, assessment reports, again, the whole range of issues related to climate change um, in that time. Um, last one came out in 2013, 2014. We're now working on the sixth one, um, the sixth assessment report. And uh, within, between those um, full assessment reports, we also produce special reports on particular topics that governments ask us to, to look at. So um, here's just an excerpt from our principles and procedures. And I want to highlight a couple of things there. Um, see, on a... Uh, the scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information at the, at the, at the uh, top. And that's just to say that we, um, we're looking not just at the, the physical fact of climate change and the, how, how that manifests itself and the causes of it, but also how that's impacting, um, um, in, impacting society, how it's impacting nature. And in, in every single way, we look, and we're looking at and also what we can do to change our, our, our activities, our behavior to prevent it in the future. So we get a whole range of disciplines. Um, um, so not, not, not just um, physics, your, your, your area, but also health, agriculture, transport, urban planning. In, in the last assessment report, the fifth one, we even had a, a philosopher from Oxford University on our author team looking at sort of equity uh, issues and so on. So that's one important point. Second important point is, um, in, the, in that second panel, um, IPC is neutral. So we're not, we don't, we don't have an agenda. We're not pushing any particular line. Uh, we're not, we, we're not advocating any particular policies or solutions. What we try to do is lay out the scientific information. We assess what the scientific community is saying and give that to governments so they know what the state of knowledge is. But we don't tell, we don't tell governments, we don't tell individuals, you should be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. And even, you know, on, on, on the, the facts of, of, of climate change, we're, we're, we're neutral, we're looking at the science, we don't have a particular line that we're, that we're pushing. Um, two, two other sort of important things I want to highlight here. Firstly, um, as I've already in, indicated, the IPCC is an assessment body. Our job is to look at the scientific research that's being published and bring it all together and say, here's what the scientific community understands about it. We don't do our own research. We don't do original research in the IPCC. We don't, do a, we don't have our own models. We don't, do our, we don't produce our own data. We assess, though, we assess models, we assess data as part of our assessment work. And also, um, it's important to understand that we're basically a an organization, we're a virtual organization, we're um, the, the people who produce the reports, people like uh, Fatima are volunteers, they're all over the world, and they volunteer their time, and their expertise to contribute to our work and produce the reports, they don't, they're not, they're not paid for the, for, for, for this, uh, um, Activity. The only people who are paid are people like me, because I'm part of a very tiny secretariat of the IPCC um, in Geneva, not a headquarters, but a, a tiny secretariat, which sort of helps facilitate the work of the, the scientists. So a quick sort of organigram here. And important to understand that actually we're, strictly speaking, formally, we're an organization of governments, our members, and not really the scientists, our members of 195 member states of the United Nations or, or the World Meteorological Organization, as a slight, slight difference there. And um, we, uh, but the work we do is done by scientists. And so we perform a very powerful 
um, interface. We, well, the reason that our reports are so strong is that they're produced by the scientific community at large and globally, but they're endorsed by the political community, by policymakers all over the world. That makes it very, very strong. And um, the, uh, the uh, governments, the members, mobilize the scientific community and um, to produce the, these assessment reports and special reports. And we're grouped into three working groups in a task force. So there's working group one, which is where Fatima is based, which looks at the physical science basis of climate change. Is, is the climate changing? How do we know what's causing it? What do we project will happen next? Working group two, impacts adaptation, looks at the, um, uh, what, what, a, what, what effect is the climate change and that as we, which we know is happening, how is that affecting uh, nature and human society? Working group three, mitigation climate change, what can we do to stop it um, in the future? There's a fourth bit task force on national greenhouse gas inventories, which does some very technical work developing methodologies and software for um, measuring and for, uh, estimating and reporting governments or countries' um, greenhouse gas emissions and also their removals through sinks like forests because if you're going to have a plan to control greenhouse gas emissions, which as we now know are the and establish the cause of climate change, we, uh, you have to be able to measure them. And any international agreement, of course, is going to be based on understanding what each party to that agreement is doing how they're controlling their, their emissions. And so the experts are grouped into those, those four bodies to produce our, our, our assessments. And uh, basically what the IPCC does is it, it, we produce reports, lots and lots of uh, documents, reports, and they're, I think they're not all there, but most of them. And um, we've been uh, recognized for our work in the fourth assessment report, which came out in 2007, we were jointly awarded the, the Nobel Peace Prize for our work in spreading uh, knowledge and information about uh, climate change. And these reports are used for a variety of things. They, they, they inform government policies. So we, we brief policymakers and government leaders um, about, about the assessments and they can use them in domestic policymaking. We, they, uh, that's the sort of that's the, our chair of the IPCC talking to a group of uh, policymakers at the top left. Uh, they go into government uh, international agreements. Um, the Paris Agreement of uh, 2015 was the, the scientific foundation of that agreement was, was our fifth assessment report. And uh, we also speak to the media and we also do events like this, outreach events, where we bring together different communities and stakeholders to talk to them. And um, this isn't done in, uh, in the abstract, it's, it's highly policy relevant, that's our goal, as I said we're neutral, we are not policy prescriptive, but we certainly aim to be policy relevant. And so we are aligned, our work is um, aligned with the, the global agenda of the sustainable development goals. And you'll see, um, the, um, the, um, Fatima will be talking later about the recent special reports and the um, the one which you I'm sure you've heard of came out two years ago the 1.5 degree report uh, I'm not sure you can see my video but I'm holding up the cover there but we'll see a picture of the cover later anyway that specifically references um, the um, sustainable development in its title full title and it has chapters de uh, dedicated to that and indeed all the reports of the IPCC in some way address those different sustainable development goals. Um, I said I'm not a scientist, but I'm going to just tell you what I've heard the scientists say. Um, and here's a very brief summary of the fifth assessment report that came out in 2013-14, as I said, fed into the Paris Agreement. So both an understanding of the, the fact of uh, climate change and, and our contribution to it, the, what, what, it, what it implies for us, but also the options for dealing with it. And that was that whole massive report was effectively distilled into those three sentences for communications purposes. And um, you'll be hearing a bit more about these from Fatima later, but these are the three special reports we've produced over the last um, two years. Um, 
again, we distilled those reports into a few very simple messages. I, I won't dwell on this for too long, but look here, you could summarize the 1.5 degree report like that. In fact, I'll be giving you a bit more of the substantive detail. And we did the same with the land report and the ocean uh, report as well. Uh, but in fact, I'll be talking about those. Um, so um, where are we now? We're, we've completed those three special reports um, over the past two years. We're now, and we've also updated our methodologies that the task force on greenhouse gas inventories uh, does, updated those last year. We also um, took part in a huge conference on climate change in cities a couple of years ago, which was uh, intended to kick, kick start, if that's the right word, the pipeline, a research pipeline for research on cities and climate change. Cities where more than half the world's population lives now. That's where climate change is happening, but also where solutions to climate change can be found. And so there's a need for research on that. And there'll be a special report on that in the next cycle. We contributed to starting that research pipeline. What we're working on now is the sixth assessment report, contributions from each of those three working groups. And then all of those contributions will be, and the special reports that have already come up, will be integrated in what we call the synthesis report, a high level document at the end of the cycle. Um, on the original timetable, the three working group contributions come out next year and the census report in 2022. But with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, that's delaying work, both the work, both of our authors, who, as I say, are doing that on top of their other day jobs, but also of the scientific community at large. So some of the scientific research that we need to bring into our reports to, to, to assess them there are delays in producing that because of the pandemic. So we're having to, we're already looking at changes to our schedule this year and early next year. And I think it's quite likely that the um, release dates of those reports will, will go back by at least a few months, but we don't have anything definite on that. Um, the, in the policy environment, they're looking to hear about those in, um, uh, in good time for the, a process called the global stock take in 2023 when the climate negotiations will review the goals of the Paris Agreement, see if we're on track there, whether we need to be more ambitious than the IPCC reports are going to feed into that. Um, so just a few words about how we prepare these reports. As I said that we bring in authors um, from all over the world to, to, to work on them. The, the um, fifth assessment report had about 830 authors uh, working on the specific chapters of each, of each report. It's a little bit less on the sixth assessment report. Um, I wanted to say in a bit more detail about the process of preparation, um, because this goes through a very, very rigorous process of, uh, you could say, a, a huge peer review process, and that the authors, once they're, once they're nominated and selected, and then we prepare an, an outline of the report um, based on the available literature um, that governments sign off on, um, the authors then prepare a first official draft of that report, I mean, there's some unofficial drafts as well, but an official draft, and that goes out to expert review and anyone can take part in that expert review with a declaration of uh, self-declaration of expertise. This is something you could consider doing your, yourselves. Um, the, um, uh, and uh, we have thousands of people. I mean, the idea is to bring in the scientific community at large, because of people who are perhaps nominated as authors but not selected but also any, any other experts who feel they have something to contribute. And also not just in, strictly in the scientific community, but also people who might want to contribute on the structure of the report or comment on the, um, on the uh, how something is formulated and communicated in it. And so we get, we get thousands and thousands of comments from those people. And every single comment that we receive must be addressed by the authors. They must take it into account in preparing the next, the next draft. 
And um, we then have a second official draft, which um, goes out to expert review again, but also this time we ask our member governments to uh, review it. And at that stage, that second order draft also includes a first draft of what we call the summary for policymakers, and um, just a high level document that summarizes the report. And the, um, on the basis of those comments, the authors then produce a final draft, um, which doesn't change substantively after that, and they revise the summary for policymakers. Governments provide further comments on the summary for policymakers. And then we go into a formal session of the panel, the representatives of the 195 governments, who go through that summary for policymakers to make sure it's fit for purpose for them. But remember, we're doing this for governments to make sure that they can use it as a, uh, as a document. But they do that in dialogue with a uh, selection of the scientists who have written the report. So if they want to make any changes for clarity, or they want to highlight something from the, the main report and bring it into the summary for policymakers or whatever, they have to work by consensus. So they have to agree among themselves that that change is something they all want. But also the scientists have to sign off it and say, this is something that is supported by the full report, the chapters, but is also scientifically rigorous and correct. So the scientists have the last word in that, in that process. So um, how can you, I'll just say for the, we've already had the review of the second order draft of the Working Group 1 report, which is probably the one that would interest you most. So your opportunity to um, contribute to that as expert reviewers has gone, but you, that you could still contribute if you were interested um, in the second order drafts of the, or the reviews and second order drafts of the working group two and three reports and indeed the census report when that comes up. Um, so ways you can contribute, we've talked about being an expert reviewer. Um, if you do that, if you're interested in that, eventually you will be noticed and you'll probably be nominated um, or through, through your other work as well as scientists you could be nominated as authors of the report. But one of the most important ways you can contribute to our work is by publishing new science, new research, because that's what we exist to do, is to assess uh, the science that's out there. So uh, we, need, we, need, we need new research. You understand? Particularly, there, there are gaps in the gaps in the knowledge are highlighted at the end of each chapter. But one constant area, or con constant gap that we have is regional information um, where we need to have so any anything you can do looking at regional implications of uh, climate change is very, is very valuable um i see how we're going for time i might have already used up more than i should so i'm gonna i'll skip that and uh say um, yeah that you can follow us if you really want to follow us the best way to do it is, is follow us on twitter because everything that we put out publicly, we, we do on Twitter and we link to it. So um, I'll stop there and look forward to your questions after uh, Fatima has spoken. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that talk, Jonathan. Um, I thought it was really interesting personally. I've heard the name of the IPCC very often, but uh, never had an insight into what exactly its work is and what it does. Um, I'm sure there'll be further questions on that later on. Um, but yes, first we'll go on to Dr. Juesh's talk. Um, I will give her a short introduction. Um, Fatima Juesh is the, as I mentioned, the vice chair of the IPCC's Working Group 1. And she was there the lead author of the IPCC's fifth assessment report, which you mentioned from 2014. She is also a member of the World Meteorological Association's Management Group Commission on Services and the Vice Chair of their Climate Standing Committee. And she is currently lecturer and researcher at the Mohammed VI Polytechnic University in Morocco. Previously, she has headed up the Moroccan National Meteorological Research Center, and she holds a PhD in Sciences of the Universe, Environment and Land Studies from the Polytechnic Institute of Toulouse, where also she graduated as an engineer. So, definitely very qualified to deliver this talk on the physical science basis of the IPCC's findings. Thank you, Fatima, for joining us.
Fatima, if you're talking, you might be on mute because we can't hear you. Yeah, I think I think we're having some difficulties with the sound there. And perhaps if you're able to disconnect reconnect again we will get to work i know it was we were hearing you earlier huh? while well, fatima is um reconnecting i see there's a question here in the q a would you like me to answer that while she's coming back uh yeah it's uh, i think a short question so uh it's aimed to both of you but i'll let you yeah. Give that answer from your perspective, John. The question is, is it difficult to stay neutral in these reports when the world is falling apart to formulate it a little sharply? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, um, when we say neutral, we don't mean we're not, we're not, um, that we're, we're, we're saying, okay, well, maybe the climate's changing, maybe it's not. We're very, very clear about the, the, the science. And, uh, you know, it's absolutely explicit that the climate is changing. And the um, and that it's down to human activity, and we lay out all sorts of options um, to deal with it. But it's not when we say neutral. What we mean is we don't push a particular solution. So I'll give you an example from another area. It's, it's widely agreed by economists that if you want to control carbon, you probably need to put a price on it in some way. Um, that, that's that's a sort of neutral statement. Um, it's just a fact of economics that uh, new things things are easier to deal with if they have a price on them. But you can't. We, what we don't say is you must put you must do you must tax carbon. You must introduce a carbon tax, or you must price carbon through a trading system. Um, we leave that to individual governments or the international principal to decide what's the best way to deal with it. So you can think of us, if you like, as, as map makers. We, the governments have set, a, and it's not us, it's governments who have set the goal of limiting global warming to two degrees um, above pre-industrial levels, and maybe, or ideally only one and a half. Um, but we don't, um, we don't uh, say, this is how you do that, the, the government. We say, governments, you want to get there, Here's a map that will enable you to get there by different routes. You choose the route that's best for you. Here are the ways of doing it, but we're not gonna tell you, you've got to do this, take this route or that route. Um, so I, I hope that explains it. We're, and I can tell you that the scientists are by no means neutral and you know, in terms of their personal engagement with this problem, they are, they're very passionate about it. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's a good overview of the topic. And it is an important point to uh, follow the science and be rigorous about that, but then advocate for what the conclusions we find are. Can you hear me now? Better? Yes, Fatima, we can hear you. You are a bit quiet. If you can get closer to the mic, perhaps. Yeah, I try. It's OK now? Better? Yes, that's better. OK. <laughs> Yeah, so I think we can get started. Okay, so thank you and apologies for this <laughs> disruption. So Jonathan has uh, recalled uh, three uh, of the main messages issued from the fifth assessment report. And the three recent IPCC special reports uh, that uh, have been prepared during the current uh, cycle, the sixth cycle, confirmed these results 
including the existence of uh, multiple observed changes in the climate system as a consequence of human-induced global warming. Also, that they confirmed that multiple lines of evidence, that there is multiple lines of evidence that these changes have had impacts on organism ecosystems as well as the human socioeconomic systems. And further warming and long lasting changes will be caused by continued emission of greenhouse gases, including the increase of, likely, of likelihood of severe and irreversible impacts for people and ecosystem. But solutions exist, but also to limit climate change, there will be need for substantial, substantial and sustained reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, but also there is need for adaptation because there are already changes and already unavoidable changes. So we need adaptation, but we need also a reduction substantial reduction and sustained reductions in greenhouse gases to limit climate change. So where we are now, let us see this from the IPCC special report, result, uh, special report on the impact of global warming of 1.5 degrees. In fact, since pre-industrial times, human activities have caused appro approximately, approximately one degree of global warming. So we, have, we are only a half a degree far from the 1.5 degree. And we already have seen consequences for people, nature, and livelihood. Another important result from this special report is that at the current rate, we would reach 1.5 degrees, not by the end of the century, but between 2030 and 2052. And also fast emissions alone do not commit the world to 1.5 degrees. Only additional emissions will do. And we can see here the global warming along the time. And we can see that human activities are behind this global warming. Another fact is that the warming is not homogeneous throughout all the world but there is regional contrast. And there is regions like, for example, the high, the high north latitude or the Mediterranean region, for example, where I am from, that exhibit warming rates higher than the global scheme. High warming rates are also projected in several regions through, through the world under 1.5 degrees of global warming and higher, again, more under two degrees of global warming. And also we can see that an additional uh, half a degree of warming will induce increased changes, will exacerbate changes in several parts of the world and mainly on land. And we can see that several parts of the world will, will uh, are projected to uh, register high, war high warming than the two degrees. And these changes are, are more intense under two degrees of global warming than under the 1.5 degrees. 
But it is worth noting that even under the 1.5 degrees, there will be important changes, including for mean temperature, precipitation changes with parts uh, with increase in precipitation and related risk and other parts with a decrease in precipitation and related risks. Exacerbated risks are also projected in terms of extremes. We have projections of increase in hottest, in hottest days, and we know what high temperatures, heat waves, and hot uh, days can have as impacts on populations, on people, and on ecosystems. But under two degrees, these changes are, will be exacerbated also for precipitation extremes, but not only the changes and the risks are exacerbated under two degrees compared to 1.5 degrees for several aspects of the changes and of climate change impacts. But as we have said, and as stated by the different reports of the IPCC, there is still solution, but we should go really uh, quick. In fact, to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees, there is, there is need to reduce the CO2 emissions by about 45% by 2013. And there is need to limit the warming, uh, the, the need to limit or to reach, uh, reach net zero emissions uh, CO2 emissions around 2050. Another important point is that national pledges, current, act, current or the uh, national pledges are not yet enough to limit warming, to allow limiting the warming to 1.5 degrees. There is still need for more efforts, for more engagement. And there is several options, several pathways that are compatible with, with the limitation of the global warming to 1.5 degrees. This includes reductions in terms of CO2 emissions, but also in terms of non-CO2 emissions. So there is need to act uh, on several sides. To act on several sides to limit the changes, not only the changes in terms of temperature or precipitation extremes or atmospheric aspects, as we know the climate is a system. We talk about the climate system and the changes in a part of the system induce changes in the other parts of the system or the components of the system. So there is need to act to limit also the impacts and the changes in the ocean and the cryosphere, two important uh, components of the climate system. And as we know, the ocean as example, but the ocean plays a central role in regulating the Earth's climate through its continuous exchanges with the atmosphere. Coastlines are home to around 28% of the world's population and 11% lives on land less than 10 meters above sea, uh, above sea, level, above sea level. And the climate change effects, the climate change effects in the ocean Include several aspects, several changes uh, are uh, observed and others expected in the ocean and the cryosphere. They include sea level rise, increase in ocean heat content, the warming, a great heat, a great part of the heat 
of human induced heat has been absorbed by the ocean. There is changes in terms of marine heat waves. So we have heat waves not only in the atmosphere, but heat, marine heat waves. Increase in ocean oxygen loss and ocean acidification. Changes in cryosphere include a decline in the Arctic sea ice extent, loss in glacier mass, performance dough, and decrease in snow cover extent. So many, many changes, several changes. And the ocean is projected to transition to unprecedented conditions as stated and demonstrated by the IPCC special report on ocean and cryosphere. And there is among the changes, the increase of sea level rise depending on the emissions as showed here. If we have low emission scenario, we will have a reduced increase in terms of sea level. And if we have intense emission scenarios, so the sea level will rise uh, till very important uh, levels, inducing several risks and important negative impacts, including the changes in terms of extreme sea level events and uh, due to the projected global mean sea level rise, local sea levels that historically occurred once per, per century are projected to occur at least once per year in several locations throughout the world. And this both under the less intense scenario and more under the RCP uh, 8.5 scenario. So the ocean and the cryosphere are expected to, uh, to register several changes and impacts. Impacts on several sides. Impacts on populations along the coasts and impacts, for example, on animal biomass, including fish and inter, and, inter, uh, sorry, and, and, and invertebrates, which means that there is risk for food security, for food security, and for food risks for food security are also projected or exists through the land because the land is evolved in the climate change and is impacted by the climate change. As stated by the IPCC special report on climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, and the greenhouse gas fluxes in terrestrial ecosystems. This title indicates implicitly the link between all these aspects around the land. And the land influence the structure and functioning of managed and unmanaged ecosystem affect local, regional, and global climates. And the changes in climate affect the, these managed and unmanaged ecosystems. For example, land surface characteristics, such as albedo, determine the amount of solar and long wave radiation absorbed by land or reflect and or reflected to the atmosphere. Land ecosystems modulate the atmospheric composition through emissions and the removal of greenhouse, many greenhouse gases. 
and this means impacts and on the impacts and effects on the climate changes. Also, atmospheric aerosols are evolved and have effects on regional climates through the alteration of the amount of precipitation. These are examples for, of land and, and climate interactions, but these uh, the interactions, there is several, several interactions. And changes in land, in land conditions modulate the characteristics of many extreme events, including heat waves and heavy precipitation events. Drought can be intensified by poor land management. Urbanization may increase extreme rain, rainfall events. And future increases in both climate change and urbanization, for example, will enhance warming in cities and their surroundings. Other aspects, for example, is the effects and the, the effects of, uh, of forest use, which may affect, which may uh, the influence regional climates, by uh, regional climates through natural land aerosols. Another interesting result from this special report is shown here also, is, show, is shown here. In fact, changes in surface air, temp air temperature over land are higher than the global, the global land and ocean mean surface temperature. Also, 20, about 23% of total anthropogenic emissions are caused directly or indirectly by human, uh, sorry, the land is uh, behind about 23% of total anthropogenic emissions caused by directly or indirectly by human activities. Natural and management land systems absorb carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide equivalent to almost a third of carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels and industry. So we have emissions from land and natural and management, managed land system absorb also uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And there is impacts, impacts due to the land-based processes and climate changes. Impacts on dry lands, for example, through water scarcity. Impacts or risks in terms of soil erosion, risks in terms of vegetation loss, wildfire damage, permafrost degradation and risks in terms of food supply and stabilities and crop yields. Yes, we have physical changes, but these changes cause impacts in several uh, human and natural system. And these impacts are different depending on our emissions, depending on the future emissions and the way we will take in the future, in the near future and in the mid, mid, medium and far future. In fact, at 1.5 degrees, we will have lower impacts on biodiversity diversity and species smaller reductions in, in yields and global population exposed to increased water shortage is up to 15% less. And we know how it is important having access to water. And 
before concluding, I would like to recall this conclusion of the 1.5 report is that climate related risks for natural and human systems are higher for global warming of 1.5 degrees than present. So additional half a degree will increase risks, but these risks will be lower than at two degrees, for example, and we can imagine what would be about higher warming uh, levels. These risks depend, however, on the magnitude and the rate of warming, as I have said, geographic location, the risks are not the same everywhere, but there is a risk everywhere. The level of development and vulnerability and the choices and implementation of adaptation and mitigation option. The choices, our choices, our consumption characteristics of behavior, our chances and implementation of adaptation and mitigation options will determine the risks in the future. And before yeah, finishing, I would like to uh, recall that the working group one is preparing its main report as, say, as said by Jonathan. And we have here the outline of the report. The report underway in, uh, in preparation includes uh, 12 chapters and an atlas of uh, of regional climate projections. And we have here the, uh, yeah, the titles of the 12 chapters, starting from uh, the context, the changing states of the climate, human influence of the climate system, future global climates, the, carb the global carbon, and other biochemical cycles, short labor climate forces, the SS energy, energy budgets, ocean cryosphere and sea level change, the link between global and regional climate change, and the weather and extreme events, and the climate change information for regional impacts and for risk assessment. So to implement adaptation and also appropriate mitigation actions, there is need for climate information. And as I have said, there is an atlas of regional climate uh, uh, projections. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Jewish. That was a concise uh, overview of the IPCC findings and definitely it constitutes a stark warning, I think, um, even more so, I would say, in the reports themselves. So um, we can move on now to questions. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions of the panelists. And while I do, I would remind everyone watching um, that they can and should submit their own questions about the speakers or about the talks that you've just seen, including if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can put them in the comments and they'll be gathered and we will bring them to the speakers in a little while um, or else here on the Zoom platform itself. But first, uh, I wanted to ask both of you in turn about your kind of backgrounds, about your career paths. Um, I can see very clearly the importance of working to advocate for climate action itself and like how that would draw you to this work. Um, but I, it doesn't seem so easy to just join the intergovernmental panel on climate change. So maybe Dr. Duresh first, uh, how did you come to participate in the IPCC and what was your background as a climate scientist before that? Yeah, okay. So uh, my background, uh, yeah, I, uh, for, um, First, I uh, I'm engineer in, meteorolo in meteorology. So, and after that, I worked at the Met Service, mostly on climate aspects, 
climate uh, observable changes, uh, climate monitoring, and project changes. So I have been working for a long time at the Met service uh, with the researchers uh, on climate, especially Moroccan climate, North African climate. But also I uh, worked on uh, more, uh, if we can say, uh, uh, not operational climate aspect, but services, also climate services. And I could, I could understand the importance of the climate information for decision making through this, through this activity. How, for example, the, the sectors, for example, the agriculture sector, water sector, uh, uh, energy sector need inform climate information for their um, day by day decision making and also for decisions within the climate change context at several uh, time scales, at several time scales. And within my activities in the, yeah, in the med service, I, uh, yeah, I have had the opportunity to postulate <laughs> Through my government of my country to the IPCC to uh, be a lead author. So I uh, first I uh, contributed to IPCC activities as a lead author in the uh, fifth assessment report. And uh, during this cycle, I uh, yeah I um, yeah I have been uh, proposed and selected also to be a part of the Bureau of the IPCC uh, as, uh, yeah, as one of the representatives, uh, if we can say it, yeah, Jonathan, of region one, which is Africa. <laughs> so there is uh, uh, participation and representation within the Bureau from each regions, from the different regions or the six uh, regions, so one of these uh, regions is uh, Africa. And uh, yes, I contributed as lead author on, and we need, there is need to, um, to work on the climate aspect. Climate is big, climate uh, domain is big domain, okay? But also you, there is need uh, just for young scientists to, um, to read to read literature, publication, to be, um, um, to uh, read several publications in your domain, to uh, be aware about the needs, the progress, the accomplishments, and also for your personal uh, research. And uh, it is, uh, in my point of view, it is very interesting uh, experience we learn a lot, we uh, help also as much as we can to disseminate also the knowledge to prepare these important report, reports. And it needs um, uh, important time <laughs> to uh, contribute to IPCC. Uh, it is time consuming, but it is very, very interesting experience. So I would like to encourage young scientists to engage in this way. I don't know if I responded to your question, but... Uh... Oh yeah, that was a good overview. And uh, we definitely uh, we definitely second that. It's specifically for physicists, we can see clearly that there's a lot of opportunity for them to get involved in climate meteorology kind of activities. Um, and it's interesting to see the work that ICPCC is doing and making all this kind of disconnected information available for scientists in all sorts of different fields. Um, and now to you, Jonathan. Um, I suppose your trajectory has been a bit different in joining the IPCC since you're in more of the kind of secretarial side uh, as one of their media people. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, my my specialization is, is communication. I, I worked, as you said, for, for, for uh, several years as a as a journalist, and I guess the specialization I had as a journalist was in explaining complex things to non-specialists. And um, so, uh, my last job as a journalist, my last post with Reuters, was running the bureau in in Geneva, which is the uh, actually the biggest UN center in the world. I mean, New York is where the a lot of the political action takes place, but a lot of the op operational special agencies are in Geneva. And so I was working with them and seeing, seeing at first hand the problems that some of them had in um, working with the media, I'd say. And so when a few years ago, the, the IPCC had a few communications problems of its own and they created my job, um, I just had some ideas at first hand of how to improve working with the media and working with the public and so that, that's why I came in. I mean to complement what um, Fatima was saying, I mean the um, working as a coming into as a scientist, I mean as I said in my presentation, it, remember it's a, it's a volunteer work so you're doing it on top of uh, your, your day job and, and as she said it's a lot of time, a big commitment of time um, but I, I think a very rewarding um, commitment as well from what I from what I hear because you meet so many people in your field but also in other fields it's a very sort of interdisciplinary approach and so very stimulating and uh, but the way to get into that is by you know public doing your own research publishing um, going to networking going to conferences and um, when that's possible uh, well it is possible now virtually and um, also where it's possible engaging with the IPCC as an expert reviewer. So sort of getting, getting the, in, into it that way as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and as well, I hope that uh, these sessions go a little way towards promoting the work of the IPCC and for people to get involved. Um, yeah, so uh, in like obviously there's a lot of different scientists from around the world involved in IPCC and I guess that's kind of an explicit thing where you have different regions and international collaboration among scientists is something that we are very invested in at IAPS um, if on a little smaller scale. So I want to ask uh, Dr. Driesch what it's like to work with such a large team of researchers on these reports and to work with scientists from across different parts of the world. Are you uh, hearing us? Was I muted there? We heard you. Okay. Might be a problem on that in a sec. You can't hear? Are you hearing us now? No? Uh, now, yes. Can you? Please, okay. Uh, yes, I'll repeat the question, of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so in short, um, we at IAPS are very invested in international collaboration among scientists, and uh, that's a lot of the IPCC's work. So I want to ask you what it's like to work with a team of researchers from such distant parts of the world, from every part of the world, and such a numerous, like, large team on these assessment reports. Yeah, uh, yeah. What I think if you work on these uh, reports, is this the question? Yeah, and like working with uh, scientists from around the world. Yeah, it's good to, um, yeah, uh, this will help uh, uh, raising awareness about the reports results, about the needs, uh, the needs in terms of research uh, in the several topics. And uh, this will also uh, help uh, um, uh, scientists to, uh, to uh, see more in detail the research, also openness of the research, how the research works and publications are useful for the international community uh, to understand the results and also to uh, this will, I think, this would uh, also um, uh, uh, help 
on uh, uh, seeing how young um, understand this research and uh, what is expect, what is, uh, yeah, what, is, what uh, are the requirements also uh, regarding these reports uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of several aspects, including uh, including uh, visual, uh, yeah, um, uh, including visual. Uh, um, uh, what I, I would like to say, uh, illustrations, uh, uh, messages. Uh, um, uh, if they uh, may understand the. Not all. It is. It is. I don't think there will be. Uh, uh, yeah, it is, if, uh, everyone is expected to understand all what is in the report, but each people, each person, for, uh, what uh, each person is expected, and we hope that uh, it may um, catch. Uh, uh, great parts of uh, yeah of the messages and the results in the reports, at least uh, linked to the uh, to uh, uh, their uh, field of expertise, and uh, I think it is such kind of international cooperation will help scientists to be aware about the. Uh, what uh, knowledge gap, the need of research, and also encourage them to contribute. As uh, presented by Jonathan, they can contribute uh, by, it is important, and this kind of activities may uh, give them more uh, appetite, if I say, to uh, publish, uh, and uh, also to engage. In, as authors, as review editors, or as uh, um, yeah, uh, review uh, reviewers, and uh, I think uh, everyone, every scientist, can make comments uh, regarding the report. This uh, help improving the report, and uh, uh, I think it would be a very inter interesting exercise for the young scientists to engage in the process. To, uh, so cooperation will arise awareness about the uh, importance of climate change, the importance of contributing as scientists, and the importance of engaging in IPCC uh, yeah, uh, processes. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. And we, yeah, we definitely hope uh, young scientists will get involved in this as well. Uh, perhaps kind of related to this, um, I want to ask you, Mr. Lin, uh, how are you planning to communicate the findings of the future assessment reports? How is the IPCC working to ensure that the next assessment report has an impact on climate action, like impacts policies? So well, we we'll put a lot of thought into this, so obviously, and uh, I think one of the things we're trying to do now is think much more uh, in much more detail and much more professionally, if you like, about the the messaging of the reports. So the reports are the you know the the, the product of years of uh, careful work by um, scientific experts, and they they bring them together. And then they develop this summary for policymakers, which is the document for, um, which will be used. This is the one that's presented in the press conference, which the public looks at, in which the policymaker will be working with. And we, um, and that's a distillation of everything that goes into the full report. And as I said, is a kind of dialogue between the policymakers and the scientists to get something that reflects the full report. There's something the policymakers can work with. But sometimes even there, we find that the language of a summary for policymakers is still not quite clear enough, for, for, certainly for non-specialists to understand. Um, sometimes, to be honest, in that, in that approval process, um, things are uh, slightly, slightly obscured for diplomatic reasons. And um, 
So we, we want to think very carefully about how, when the report is approved, how the scientists can then go and talk about it. Well, based on what the text that is, they've worked on for the, all those years, the text of the summary that's been formally approved, but how do we develop messaging? And um, we, we already work with authors. We do give them so-called media training. So we get experts who work with them, say this is how you can, this is how you should go into an interview, think about the messages, and the ideas you want to get across the journalists to, to, to work with. Um, how, how, you, how you structure it. And um, in the course of doing that, and, and, and this was because of the 1.5 degree report, we found that the, the scientists themselves were coming up with a very clear way of talking about the, the report that was, because it was coming from the scientists themselves, it was stronger than if it was coming from a communications expert like, like me, who might be getting it slightly wrong. So, we really tried to develop this idea of getting the scientists to talk about what are the, for them are the key messages in this report? How do we express it, both in the summary for policymakers, but also if, if I have 30 seconds for a TV interview or, or 15 minutes to sit down with a journalist um, or to be giving a, a short presentation in a, in a conference, which may be scientists or it may be practitioners in different fields. And so we're, we're trying to get messaging that gets the sense of the um, of the um, report across in a clear accessible way but that's what that's what we're focusing on at the moment i think you're on mute mute yes sorry about that thank you for that overview i wanted to ask you as well um more broadly, what's the role of the media in taking this information about climate change, which the IPCC uh, collates, about taking this information to the ordinary person? Yeah, well, it's it's key, and I mean, as I said at the beginning, strictly speaking, our audience is policymakers, so they're aiming to speak to governments, uh, policymakers, but that covers a very broad range of things. It's not it's not just the the prime minister or president or minister, but it, it's the the people working in whether in different ministries, but also in regional bodies, handling water or you know, any, any, any government agency, and it's any level, international, national, provincial, state, counties, uh, uh, city, whatever. Um, now, um, but we also know that we need to reach the public. There's a huge public interest in our work, which has been growing and really exploded at the time of the 1.5 degree report. So we know we have to talk to them. And in any case, the, the policymakers are listening to what the public says. So we know that we have to give correct and accessible information to the public um, so that they, you know, they're getting the, giving the right messages to policymakers, as taxpayers, as voters, and so on. Um, so the media is, uh, plays a, a critical role in that. And of course, there are different types of media. You have the general national media. We also have specialists, what are specialist media focusing on climate change or specialists working in different areas of, of science and uh, or business and so on. So, but it, it's very important and we put a big effort into working with the media to get, to get the message across. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and let's go back to Dr. Duresh here and ask, uh, maybe in the same vein, um, what message would you give right now to the young students and young scientists who are watching? Um, can you encourage them to participate in the work of the IPCC? I guess the answer to that one is yes, but. I heard at least the first part of the question. But what I would say to the young scientists is that combating climate change cannot be reached without you. We need everyone on board. So we need your youth, we need young scientists. So please stay to engage. This is my message for young scientists. Yes, and uh, I absolutely definitely echo that point as an organization. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, 
maybe you can outline what will be the main implications of climate change and importantly do we still have the means to limit it um, at present yes I, as i have showed in the presentation and you can find more and more results in the reports we have the ways to do there is still possibility to uh, to act to limit the climate change but we should do quickly and appropriately in an appropriate manner and everyone should contribute everyone everyone all people around the world all the um, and the sectors, uh, normal people, uh, decision makers, young, older, <laughs> old people, everyone should contribute, but there is need for, um, um, how to say, uh, not bad, and sure there is need for uh, actions of decision makers around the world. But there is still possibility, but we should act now, not tomorrow. We should act now in the most appropriate manner. But there is still chance for all of us and for the future generation. We, there is still chance for us to uh, limit chance for us and for the next generations that's a strong message i uh, hope uh, we can hope that it's listened to um soon um i have another question for mr lin um i want to ask like what is the ipc's role in combating misinformation or even disinformation about climate change we can see that um like messaging and information about climate change has become much more prevalent in recent years, but this has also been uh, followed by a rise in this misinformation. Um, what can we as young scientists do to help combat this? Yeah, well, we could probably talk for hours about this. Um, um, we in the IPCC, um, we, I mean, if, if we see something that is factually wrong you know, if somebody puts that on a blog, even the IPCC says there's no such thing as climate change, then we would we would sort of rebut that. But we don't get into debates with people who are denying it because they're probably not we're probably not going to change their minds very much, and it's still, it's, still, it's a bit of a waste of time. And there are other people who will do that more effectively than we can with our very limited resources. Our, our job is to put is to get the best science and put it out there and make sure that we're communicating it in a clear way. Now there's a, there is, you'll be interested to know, or maybe you know already, there's a whole discipline of the science of science communications. And we're, we're looking at that, we may even be holding an expert meeting on that on that topic. And there, there's a, a lot of people working in this, both as, as, as academics, but also as practitioners. And so there's a, there's a risk how, when somebody says something that's wrong, how do you, combat it, if you repeat it in order to rebut it, actually psychologically you reinforce it in their, in their minds. So you have to be very careful about doing that. Um, and so you, there are all sorts of ways people are looking at how you approach this and, and um, without reinforcing the misinformation, which can be in good faith, but just wrong, or it can be deliberate and mischievous and trying to confuse things. Um, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And of course, it doesn't just apply to climate change, it applies very much to health, as we're, we're seeing now, and, um, and uh, other areas like food, food safety would be another, another one. Actually, the, the UN is running a big um, campaign at the moment um, on misinformation. There's a lot of misinformation is simply spread by people you see something on your your twitter feed or on or instagram or something and you think wow well i'm 
Jesus, I'm telling my friends about that, bang. And, um, and that's how it spreads. And people there do the campaign and say, if, it's, if, it's, if it shocks you like that, then hold on and um, wait and have a look and think before you, you spread it. Um, so it's being looked at UN, um, UN-wide. But we, um, and you know, it's very, once, once some, some of these things take hold, it can be very hard to stop them. I mean, just to pick up on some of the early things we've been talking about, like your last question to, to Fatima, do we, do we still have time to do this? Um, when the 1.5 degree report came out, a lot, a lot of the news, instant news headlines were um, IPCC says we have 12 years to save the planet, right? Because people said the IPCC is saying we'll hit 1.5 degrees in 2030. This came out in 2018, so we've got 12 years left. And that became a kind of meme, but we, we never actually said that. And um, I'm now you know, breaking the rule I talked about earlier because I'm repeating the wrong thing. And you'll probably all go away remembering that. But what we didn't, what we said, and I mean, Fatima's presentation showed you, and this is one actually one of the really surprising things about the 1.5 degree report, how much difference 1.5 degrees of warming makes compared with two degrees, right? So even that half a degree makes a big difference in terms of impacts. But that applies across the board. Those figures of 1.5 and 2 are not sort of graven in stone and you know th those are figures set by government set by policymakers set by negotiators on the basis of reading past IPCC reports about the impacts of climate change and they they concluded the politicians concluded climate change is happening it's dangerous this this would be a relatively safe level we should aim to stop here but um we, we know if we if already 1.5 degrees, as Fatima said, is worse than where we are now, one degree. Two degrees would be even worse than that. Well, if we miss 1.5 degrees, it doesn't mean game over. It means let's try and hold it at 1.6 or 1.7 rather than 2.5 or 2.6. And that, that's why one of those little summaries of the 1.5 degree report I showed is every bit of warming matters. And similarly, we're not saying if you don't do it by 2030, it's, it's all over. No, we're, what we're saying is governments have said we should aim for 1.5 degrees. On the present trajectory that we're on now, we will hit 1.5 degrees in 2030. Let's try and do something about it. If we miss, if we don't manage to stop it by 2030, well, let's not give up and, you know, let, let's carry on trying to stop it so it doesn't get worse in 2040 or 2050. So again, every year matters. And that's what, what I think, I think that's what Fatima is saying. She says, we have to do it now. Don't leave it till tomorrow, start sooner. But there's no deadline in terms of time or in terms of, of warming where we are finished. We just have to, it's a continuous thing. We have to keep, keep uh, working on it. And the IPCC has laid out the actions that we can take, and these involve radical transformations across all areas of society and activity. But we've shown this is that if you do that, it can be done. And we know from the past that radical transformations do, do happen. We're not talking about something that's completely in, impossible. Yeah, I guess, um, I guess there's a lot of subtlety in the messages that come out of this scientific information it's it's difficult to communicate the points that you want to be communicated you can see how it gets away from you. so i admire you in that work there um yeah so i will move on to some questions about your talks i have a couple and again i'll ask if there are any from the audience uh, to submit them now um so first about your presentation mr then you mentioned the kind of rigorous review process that each of the IPCC's reports have. I want to ask uh, how important you find this process to be, because I imagine it's like very important to add legitimacy to your work that's been reviewed so strongly, but I wonder if it slows down the pace of your work and like, is there good engagement from governments and policymakers when you're asking for this, uh, for this review from them? 
Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I would say it's fundamental to, to the process, and that, that's how we're designed to do that, because it, it, it gives a kind of uh, scientific legitimacy to the whole thing. It's not only that we bring together authors and experts nominated by their, nominated by different countries um, to produce the reports, but we really want to get the scientific as broad and as many people in the scientific community at large, and that's understood very loosely. Really, anyone who says I'm an expert, I can contribute. We want to have their input to make, so really, is there anything that, that's been missing that's overlooked? And sometimes the scientists will, we also have a, uh, uh, and, and when I talked about 830 authors on the fifth assessment report, and Fatima showed a slide about 130 authors of, on 1.5 degrees. In addition to that, we have people called contributing authors who are brought in by the main author team, maybe just to write one paragraph in the report, but on a particular area of expertise that they have, which maybe the broader author team doesn't have. And that, that might arise from one of these comments that comes in and the the authors say, oh yeah, we, we need something on that, but let, let's invite that, that reviewer to do that. Because um, to say every, every comment that we get has to be addressed, but the most powerful comments are the ones that say, that give a link to a piece of research that hasn't been cited in the, in the report. That's a very strong comment. And it's easy then for the authors to look at it and assess how, um, uh, you know whether they shouldn't reflect that comment or say no. We we can we've already taken account of this point or this point isn't isn't um, substantive enough for us. Um, but that review process is absolutely critical, and of course it takes time. And there are very clear procedures which lay out how long the take and the gaps between the review processes. And obviously we don't want to have two review processes going on simultaneously because it's. Um, particularly for governments, then it's, it's difficult. But um, that is key to the whole process. And we, we get really good engagement on that. I mean, lots of governments, but thousands of reviewers. And again, that slide the, the Fatima put up, got the numbers of the 1.5 degree report. It was, uh, remember there, 130 authors. We got from the two uh, reviews, 42,000 comments. Now imagine you're one of those authors working um, who divided into five chapters and you're you're doing this in your own time you know in the weekends and evenings and things and then you're getting from the IPCC here's your share of the 42,000 comments to look at and tell us whether we need to revise the report we take it very seriously but we get that engagement and that's what makes it that's what makes it really uh, strong I'm just going to add to something uh, you asked Fatima before about the you know the international Yes. Oh, again, we actually have that formally laid out in our process that we, in fact, Fatima mentioned that she's a, um, an author for the region, the African region. So we use these are the regions of the World Meteorological Organization. We make sure that we have a balance on the author team of authors from every region. And, um, and, and, and more importantly, a balance of authors between developed and developing countries. It's uh, that's sort of work in progress. We're not we're not there yet, but with the land report, for the first time we had a majority of the author team came from developing countries, and that's very important to ensure that we get a, a genuine global perspective on the report, and that it's not just a sort of a narrow position reflecting the the, the consensus in a few in a few countries or in a few universities, but that it's really a glo a global product. Yeah, yeah, of course, that is uh, uh, very important. And we uh, definitely we stand for international collaboration, that means. Um, I have a question from the audience for Dr. Jewish. Um, uh, this is kind of, I guess, scientific question, if you can maybe speak to this. But they were asking about uh, mitigating the impact of ocean warming. And they, they mentioned, they, they asked, um, if injecting or adding ocean or sorry if adding oxygen to the oceans has any impact on mitigating their warming maybe you can talk as well about um, any other strategies that are used yeah 
you are still on mute there. No, your, your microphone is still muted. I can't hear. Now it's okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. There you go. So the question was about uh, uh, adding oxygen to the ocean. Okay, I um anyway um uh, don't know if the this may be um, uh, called the kind of geoengineering or not, but uh, uh, the ocean, uh, the changes in the ocean are not limited to the oxygen loss. We have several changes in the ocean, sea level rise with very important risks. Uh, uh, warming, the warming of the ocean with the with the uh, risks in terms of sea level uh, rise, but also risks for biodiversity for uh, in the ocean. Uh, the changes in the oceans are not limited to what they would say if this is possible. Even if, but I do not confirm. <laughs> and even if this will resolve a part of the changes, they will not resolve several changes. And uh, what about the impacts, the possibilities, the efficiency? So several questions are still uh, posed. But in all cases, they will not resolve all the will not resolve all the problem. This will not. Uh, limit all the or reduce all the changes uh, and impacts of climate change on the ocean they are bigger than the uh, on the only uh, side which is important the oxygen loss but this will not resolve all the uh, problem like for other uh, yes uh, for the other aspects regarding mm -hmm. for example the yeah, the solar radiation management, etc. Yeah. Thank you. That's a that's a great answer and um, a good overview. This is of that. my this is my personal uh, view. <laughs> this is my personal <laughs> view. Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, we could always encourage like more reading and research be done after this uh, presentation. Um, so we have another question in the meantime. Um, one of the audience was asking about the distinction between climate change caused by human activities and climate change caused by natural processes, which um, these both contribute to the changing of the climate. Um, but they were asking, like, you know, how much human activities uh, contribute and cause directly this global warming, this climate change. in terms of cost? Uh, no, in terms of like, I guess, how much effect each of these has on uh, the changes we are measuring in our climate. Yeah, the uh, human activities uh, versus natural processes. Yeah, we have, for example, we have seen the, the slide with the global warming and with the human induced warming and natural uh, induced uh, warming and cooling and uh, yes if uh, yeah if you recall this this big difference and the uh, not the human induced how we recall how the human induced uh, warming is near to or um, is uh, yeah is is um, more compatible with the observed warming than the natural aspect. This give us an idea, clear idea, and uh, there is also a, a clear an idea about the about the human effect and the part linked to the human activities. And there is uh, several uh, detection and attribution studies that. Uh, uh, allowed uh, uh, attributing uh, uh, 
uh, several changes, great part of the changes to human activities. And we have several uh, uh, results and illustrations in the different reports, including the uh, fifth assessment report. So, um, yeah, there is clear, um, uh, there is clear uh, high contribution or the highest part, at least the highest or the biggest part is of the changes uh, is linked to human activities. And we have the details in the, the reports. And the, the, yeah, there will be, uh, uh, yeah, we will uh, see, um, it's okay, I, I, I will not talk the main the current uh, the main reports underway but uh, uh, in the special reports and in the assessment the fifth there is a lot of results demonstrating the role of human activities uh, in terms of the changes physical changes and also the related impacts yeah uh, i think yeah thank you for laying that out very clearly um so we have one more question from the audience. Um, they were asking about the temperatures, uh, the change of temperatures of the oceans, and they want to know how does the oscillation of the Pacific Ocean affect these temperatures? How does the, um, the observation affect the... They say the, the Pacific oscillation. So I guess they mean the natural the rising and lowering of the sea level i'm not personally familiar with the check, but aren't they, aren't they talking about I have like from, okay the, the ocean currents I'm guessing that's, that's uh possibly they uh what well, they mentioned was the pacific uh, oscillation um if you're familiar with that term uh the pacific oscillation and the uh, yeah the changes uh uh yeah uh, i'm not a specialist in that aspect but uh, globally uh uh yeah we we know that there is uh, uh natural variability so for example we have the el nino independently from climate change we have this uh, this event and for example, we have the North Atlantic Oscillation. We have the Pacific Oscillation. And, uh, uh, but uh, even, uh, I don't know, uh, the inter through the interactions between ocean and the atmosphere, uh, the warming, the warming uh, will have effects, but with different, with different, uh, yeah, uh, effects with uh, 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 with different. I don't have uh, different effects on the world climate system, including uh, including the uh, exchanges, interactions uh in uh, several parts of the world uh for example where 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 we have uh where we have um uh, how to say um warming warming ocean and for we will have more um uh just say, more uh, uh, more evaporation, uh, more um, uh, convection, more convection, for example, and uh, this the, uh, through the changes between atmosphere and the ocean, this may uh, induce changes in these uh, interactions, including oscillation. But uh, I can't say more for some specific. Uh, uh, aspects, but in general, interactions and the warming and the throw the interactions between ocean and the atmosphere, there is changes 
in several uh, aspects of the climate system, including the uh, oscillations. But anyway, I think I, uh, yeah, I didn't respond correctly uh, to the question, but uh, yeah, because I didn't uh, have all the, yeah. I think, uh, well, yes. Um, and I want to ask a follow-up question on that. They're welcome to. Um, in the meantime, we have another question, which um, I'm not sure who it's aimed at, but perhaps either of you can answer because it's kind of general. It is, someone was asking, does the question of which country is responsible for climate change, does that question make sense? And how can you respond to it? Well, I can say something about that. Um, not really from a scientific perspective, but just um, obviously it's a highly political question. And it's something that governments are interested in and would could play a role in international negotiations. Now, um, whether, the, whether governments who set the parameters of our work would want us to be talking about that, I don't know. Now, we have looked at this in the past in, in, in the Working Group 3 contribution to the fifth assessment report. Now, you have to bear in mind there are many different ways of measuring emissions. So you can look at current emissions and you can look at historic emissions, for instance. So at the moment, um, my, I'm from the UK, my own country, the UK, uh, is now using as much coal as it did in 1769 at the start of the Industrial Revolution. So you could say, good UK, you're not producing nasty emissions, at least in coal. But in the intervening 250 years, we did. Now, so do you count what we're doing at the moment or what we did in the past? So that's one way. And what? And if you're looking at it now, the present, what period do you look at? Do you look at the last year, the last 10 years, the last 40 years? You'll see that countries that have recently, um, you know, countries that have been the developed countries have sort of plateaued in terms of their emissions or they're growing more slowly. Um, countries that are industrializing will have much higher emissions for that period. So the period you choose is particularly sensitive. Now, we're seeing currently, if you read the news, just we're seeing changes in the world trading system and um, it's, it's a sort of a moving target. But in recent years, there was a clear shift from manufacturing in some countries that was outsourced to other countries. And then those products were brought back into the countries that used to produce those things. I'm thinking of things like in industrialized developed countries used to do a lot of steel production. Then that was taken over by countries like China or other developing countries. But the product, and, and that, that causes a lot of emissions. But then the product, the produce, goes back to the country, other the countries that used to do that stuff. So do you measure the emissions in terms of production or in terms of consumption? There's a, tra a trade. Uh, so these are basically political questions. And to the extent that we look at political questions, because there's a scientific, you know, there's political science, we do, we do consider them. But how they're presented is a very political, politically sensitive matter. And um, it's, it's, uh, I, I can't ever imagine the IPCC, which formally is an organization of governments, singling out one of those governments and saying, it's all your fault. They're gonna sort of do it in a very sober scientific way. And that governments draw those, those, those conclusions. Yeah. Um, Dr. Juresh, do you have anything to add to that question? Uh, I think you are on mute at the moment. Or oh, can't you? Have you, uh, are you able to unmute yourself there for a second? Yeah. Can, can okay, you? Okay, there we go. 
Yes, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I was about to write in the response to Zahran about the, yeah, the, the Pacific and, uh, yeah. I don't know, uh, what was your uh, question? I was about to write in, uh, oh. Um, I just wanted to ask briefly if you had any comments on the last question about uh, the question of which country is responsible for climate change. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, we, 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 uh, well, yeah, yeah. That uh, um, I want to say that everyone is responsible, but there is differences. Sure, that there is uh, regions uh, uh, that uh, have. It's my personal, uh, yeah, my personal, uh, yeah, uh, response that there is uh, differences in emissions between regions, between countries, etc. But uh, uh, and the. Uh, we, uh, yes, between regions, for example, uh, we have regions that uh, emitted more than others, etc. But I would, I will uh, come back to this uh, idea the, that I trust we should all contribute to limit climate change, even if, uh, yes, sure, uh, yes, everyone have, has not the same capacity. Uh, 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 we don't, there is no the same capacities everywhere, everywhere for everyone, except contribution from all is important. And uh, sure, there is, uh, uh, if we look at the historical emissions, etc., observations uh, stay, uh, yeah, shows, show clearly that uh, some regions, some parts of the world emitted more than others because of progress, etc. But, uh, but again, I, uh, I uh, would like to say we uh, need everyone on board, including for mitigation, but also for adaptation. We do not, uh, we uh, don't, uh, we should not uh, forg forget adaptation. It is important. Adaptation is also important. So we need everyone on board. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, had you a response as well to the last question? You mentioned you were writing something there. Sorry, which question? Uh, to the one that was in the chat from. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was about uh, saying that uh, under the, yeah, the influence of the so the me climate for Pacific region, yeah, will probably undergo significant changes, including through easterly trad winds, uh, um, uh, surface ocean temperature. Uh, the changes in surface temperature, uh, surface ocean temperatures, are expected to warm faster, and there will be impacts. Uh, and the uh, impacts uh, um, through the wind mixer upper ocean and also deeper layers, etc. But uh, it, we ca it is not yet uh, clear. We will say what we will see what the uh, main uh, six assessment report will say. Uh, about this uh, as uh, uh, in terms of new findings about this, but it is not yet, uh, for example, uh, uh, possible to say uh, whether uh, the, yeah, this will uh, enhance ENSO activities or no. But uh, yeah, there is a lot of publication, a lot of uh, on that topics, but uh, let us see also what uh, will be the main conclusions of the six assessment report, especially the report of working group one. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a fair answer, I think, uh, to that point. I will, we have one more question from the audience, which I'll ask now and then I think we'll wrap up. Um, we've gotten a good number of questions answered. So this is 
um, for you again, Dr. Dresch. Someone was asking that in the last decade, we've seen a lot of uh, disasters, uh, natural disasters, and like more risk from weather events and high temperatures in the world. So someone was asking, are we seeing a kind of, are we seeing new climate systems um, emerging currently as a result of climate change? Are we seeing kind of, um, I guess a shift in the way that the Earth's climate is operating already due to this uh, rising temperatures? Uh, yeah, I, I, as I have uh, said uh, in the, my pre presentation, that's several lines of evidence and several observations and sources of observations um, have uh, demonstrated the existence of already of changes. We have the climate systems has already uh, registered changes has already registered changes in several aspects. So uh, yes, we uh, have already registered changes and uh, depending on the future emissions, there will be future uh, additional future changes with severity, ex extent and uh, persistence depending on the emissions. Yeah, there is something here, I don't know where. I think it's fine. Yeah, is that? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so I think we will uh, wrap up the session there. That's, I think, a good place to leave it on. Um, before we finish, I want to ask uh, each of you if you have any last words um, that you'd like to say to the audience. Uh, maybe Mr. Lin first. Oh, no, just th thanks. Thanks for the attention. Thanks for the thanks for the great questions. Um, do do look at, do look out for the reports. They're they're a, a, res a resource for you in your work, but also hopefully something that you'll be able to contribute to as as reviewers or, or authors or or um, people publishing their own scientific research on Monday. And um, yeah, we 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 hope that uh, this is find your interests in our, in our work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Dresch, if you have anything to say. You are, oh uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, it's okay now, yeah. So yeah. Uh, what I'd like to say is thank you for this uh, kind initiative. And uh, I hope there will be uh, more exchange and lessons between uh, young uh, uh, scientists around the climate change and uh, more contribution uh, to, to deal with the knowledge gaps also and to progress knowledge about the whole climate change aspects. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we hope the same at IAPS. Um, and we're very pleased to uh, have you both here for this talk. We're grateful for the IPCC's engagement with our little online sessions. Um, just to remind everyone before we finish this session is hosted by the International Association of Physics Students. And we have many more coming up. Uh, we have one more today, I think, and many more in the next couple of weeks. Um, if you'd like to learn more about these, head, you can head over to our website, iapps.info, or check out our Facebook page. Um, so thank you very much.